I'm going to invite my friend Seth up here to the stage. If you don't know Seth, hi church, this is Seth. Now you do. What's happening? <laughs> Leave it up to these, what's with these sound guys? Normally Seth, you probably should be. Uh, normally Seth is back there, and normally that's where he, he glows and shines, and now he can shine even more on stage, quite literally. We love Seth. Uh, Seth, what brought you to Connection? How long have you been coming to Connection? Uh, been here about a year. Um, got baptized in September, and I guess what brought my wife and I here, or my family here, was we had gone to a uh, couple's retreat and took this real long quiz and uh, about things we need to work on, you know, as a couple. And I mean, there were some things that were glaring, some things we were great at, some things we weren't great at, but uh, what we came away with was we can focus on any one of these things or we can focus on God and our relationship with Him and it can improve all of these things. And that's yeah. kind of what got us hunting for a church family. Yeah. So. Amen. So you, you came to Connection, you kind of saw a bit of who we were, like, but what keeps you coming back to Connection? Well, this is my family here. It's my church family. So <laughs> that's, that's a good answer. Uh, normally, Seth and his family throughout the school year, they can be found uh, with my family and very many other families uh, crammed in our living room, kids running up and down the stairs screaming and yelling at each other. It's a beautiful hot mess that we call grow group. Sometimes we get through the whole thing. Yeah, it's awesome. And, and sometimes, well, no, not really. Normally, there's always crying. Yeah. And sometimes it's Seth and I right. uh, as we chase our kids down. <laughs> but it's awesome, and that's Grow Group, and I can't imagine it any other way. But uh, I've really gotten a chance to know Seth uh, through Grow Group on Monday night, and, and he's been taking that over and really like leading that conversation for us, facilitating those questions. Uh, Seth has been helping out the worship team in the sound booth, learning how to run that board, and uh, even plugged in downtown at YFC doing some Madison Detention Center stuff, going up there on the weekends once in a while. And sharing Jesus with these kids who are incarcerated. And uh, I know God has been preparing Seth for this moment. And we've tried uh, encouraging him in that, that he knows that. And uh, can be a little less nervous this morning. So church, uh, just thank you for, for Seth and his time. Let's make some ways for Seth and check out the screens. Now I realize that you guys have probably heard about this other villain who stole the pyramids. Apparently it's a big deal. People are calling it the crime of the century and stuff like that. But, am I upset? No, I am not. A little, but we have had a pretty good year ourselves. And you guys are all right in my book. <laughs> No, no raises. You're not going to get any uh. raises. What did we do? Well, we stole the Times Square Jumbo Drop! <laughs> nice! Huh? That's how I roll! Yeah, you all like watching football on that, huh? But that's not all. We stole the Statue of Liberty! <laughs> The small one from Las Vegas. And I won't even mention the Eiffel Tower. Also Vegas. Okay, I wasn't going to tell you about this yet, but I have been working on something very big. Something that will blow this pyramid thing out of the water. And thanks to the efforts of my good friend, Dr. Nafario. Thank you! Oh, there he is. He's styling. Now, we have located the shrink ray in a secret lab. And once we take this shrink ray, we will have the capability to pull off the true crime of the century. We are going to steal. <laughs> wait, wait! I haven't told you what it is yet. <laughs> hey, Dave, listen up, please! Beetle. Next, we are going to steal. Pause for effect. Hey. Well, should we keep watching it? That's pretty good, right? <laughs> so, Eighth Commandment, 
don't steal. Go ahead and cue the rest. No, I'm just kidding. Don't. <laughs> All right. So today we're talking about the Eighth Commandment. Thou shalt not steal. I'm going to start with a confession. So I stole something a couple weeks ago. <sighs> Went to go get a trailer because I found this awesome play set for my kids for the backyard. <clears throat> so I enlisted the help of some friends. I hear sirens already. Oh, boy. <laughs> and so Mark has a, tra has a trailer we can borrow, he says. So we go to Ag Park the day before. Um, still after me, apparently. <laughs> we go to Ag Park the day, the day after. They had the fireworks the day before. And Mark tells me he's got to run back to his house and pick something up. I'm not sure what it is. I, men communicate really well, you know. So, uh, <laughs> so he left, and I thought, well, I'm not just going to sit here. I'm going to hook up the trailer, at least get something out of the way so we can go get this play set. And so I hook up the trailer, and I get this text from Mark, where are you at? <laughs> and I, I said, well, I had a little trouble with the trailer. I'm on my way. Well, he knew right away that, like what what trailer right so I get to his house with this trailer and uh, he says what's that and I said that's a trailer whose trailer and so well that's your trailer and it's not my trailer and so so we started the 4th of July off with grand theft trailer uh, <laughs> so what I want to we did bring I brought it back by the way <laughs> better better tell you all that before I go any further but so what have you stolen you know what it feels like, you know, um, make you feel violated, right? If somebody steals, steals your car, your trailer, uh, <laughs> uh, steals your identity, right? Feel violated. Um, you've got to go through the steps to get your belongings back. Um, you know, so stealing is such a big problem. It's so prevalent. Uh, we don't even think about all the countermeasures that we take every day to protect us from, from theft or from stealing. You know, you've got, on your house, you've got locks on the doors, you've got um, maybe an alarm system, or um, maybe you have a dog, a pug, schnauzer, I don't know, um, to protect your belongings. Um, and all those things are to protect from stealing. So many of you know I'm an insurance agent. I'm not up here to sell anything to you today. It's usually how every phone call starts. I'm Seth, I'm an insurance agent. I'm not selling anything. Um, but I do want to give you some, some free information, right? So a lot of people don't know that they can get discounts on their insurance premiums based on precautionary measures they can take. So um, if you've got an alarm system, sometimes there's discounts for that, right? Um, but what people don't, under, don't know a lot of times is your premiums, your rates are also based on your neighborhood. Um, and the likelihood of claims, the likelihood of theft, the likelihood of burglary. Um, Jake and his lovely wife just bought a house, and there was a pretty big crime that took place over there. So I don't know if I'll still be able to insure you or not. Just kidding. No. Um, but all those things do. They affect your premiums. Um, and, and all that is to protect from stealing. The same, same is true for your car, right? So maybe you have an alarm system on your car. Um, You've got locks on your car. Hopefully you don't leave the keys in the car. That's a good good thing <laughs> if you don't. Uh, but, but again, where you park your car when you're not driving it, that garaging address, that goes into your rate because we're looking at the risk versus reward. So the insurance company reward is more, more money without a claim, right? Um, so just a week ago, I had a client who had his car taken for a joyride. And we have a device in there for tracking it. So some of you have something to track your vehicle if it gets taken. And we were able to find out exactly where it went and who took it. And those kids will have to deal with that, the repercussions for theft. Um, so there's your free advice. If you want lower premiums, just go buy a different house. It's that easy. <laughs> but even technology, right? So we've got our phones, our iPads. Our laptops, they all have codes, passwords, um, websites. And on those, you're constantly having to change your passwords. At work, I've got to change it every so often, and then I can't even keep track of what my password is. I'm locked out. Um, it actually happened while I was preparing this, this message. I 
was typing it up and I had put off that you know, warning, you have 15 days to change your password. Put it off, 10 days, five days, and it rebooted itself and I lost what I had been working on. So anyway, good stuff, right? <laughs> but you know why though, right? It's to protect your data, right? So the dictionary's definition of stealing is stealing is taking something that doesn't belong to you without permission or right, especially in secret or by force. So the big idea is if it's not yours, don't take it. Um, and, you know, it's pretty simple. Seems pretty straightforward. Most of us feel like we're doing pretty good there, right? Um, stealing was an issue in the past. In the Old Testament, in uh, Genesis 27, Jacob stole uh, Esau's blessing from their father. Um, it was a problem in the New Testament. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> In John 12, 6, Jesus was stolen from by his friend in, G in Judas, uh, who was the treasurer for uh, Jesus and his followers. And stealing is an issue now. Um, whether we realize it or not, we steal from our employers, we steal from our employees, our family, our neighbors, and we steal from God. And I'll get more on that in a minute. Um, my guess is stealing is going to continue to be an issue, especially in our day of technology. It just increases the ways in which we can steal from one another. Um, so my question is, who have you stolen from? What have you stolen? And I challenge all of us that uh, we have stolen from someone and that someone may be God. Okay? So here's what God says about stealing in Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. It's a long one. The Eighth Commandment says this, you shall not steal. Okay? So there's no exceptions. There's no caveat. Um, it's not like an insurance policy with uh, exclusions and endorsements. It's just plain and simple. Do not steal. Just don't steal. And I think what happens sometimes in our faith is that it gets selfish and we're only concerned about us and our relationship with God and we're not concer concerned about others. And Jesus tells us to love our neighbors, right? One way we love our neighbors is by not stealing from them, right? Um, Commandments 5 through 10 are in large part about loving your neighbor. And so a couple weeks ago in our backyard Bible study, um, which I'm totally going to promote, like backyard Bible study, it rocks. Yes? Awesome. Everybody that hasn't been there should come. It's awesome. <laughs> um, but we were talking about in Titus chapter 1, talking about the characteristics of, of elders, and someone in our group mentioned that you know, those would be good characteristics for all of Christians to try to follow, right? <laughs> So some of those things are stewardship, generosity, um, gratitude, forgiveness, a lot of really great things that we all should strive for. So don't steal from your neighbor. Seems pretty simple, right? God believes in private property ownership, and God believes in not just doing what's best for you, but what's best for your neighbor. So uh, he wants us, if God wants us to love, and we don't love our neighbor, we're stealing from God. He wants us to serve, and we're not serving them. We're stealing from God. Because God wants us <clears throat> wants to bless your neighbors through you. We have a right not to be stolen from and a responsibility not to steal from others. What starts to undermine our entire culture is when people are far more committed to their rights than their responsibilities and getting what they think they should get rather than giving what God wants them to give. No oh, great, he's going the tithing route. Thought we already did this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so on the projector, I'm going to, there it is. There's a couple ways we steal, right? That's just some of the ways that came up with, and I figured once I filled the projector, that was probably enough to know that it's a pretty big problem we have in our, in our culture. <clears throat> it's not a complete list. Um, <clears throat> A couple things I wanted to touch on, though, um, talking about employers, right? So, again, I'd argue that we're all employers. You know, maybe it's not of a business, but if we hire someone to reshingle our roof, we've employed them, right, to remodel our house. We've employed them to work on our car. We've employed them. So you're an employer to somebody. So in James 5, 4 through 5, on page 1013, 1013 in your Bibles. 
<clears throat> Here's what the Bible says on employers. It says, Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. So fraud is stealing and keeping back what's not yours is stealing. If you're an employer and you've agreed to pay someone for the work that they've done and they complete it and you don't pay them, you're stealing from them. So this isn't talking about people who didn't do their job. You know, and we may all know someone like that. Maybe we're guilty of that. Um, so how many of us work for someone else? I, again, argue we all work for someone else one way or another. Um, so the Bible speaks to us as employees as well in Titus chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, which is on page 998 in your Bibles. I'll get there. I'm not just trying to kill time, I promise. <laughs> All right. Titus chapter 2, verse 9. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering. There's the Eighth Commandment, not stealing but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So we don't have an equivalent to that. We don't have bond servants necessarily, but we do have employer-employee relationships, right? And again, that can be you hired someone to do something for you, or it can be at your place of work. Um, and in that, you have those in authority, which could be you, may not be you, and you have those under authority. Isn't it nice having all these readings? Colossians 3.23 to 24, which is on page 985. That says, whatever you do, work heartily. Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So what Paul's saying there is to let work be your work be your witness. Uh, make sure that you're working hard, right? You're, you're striving to be the best you can and do the best you can. You're reliable. Uh, and, and that you respect authority also. So that way, when your coworkers or other people in your life, they see that you as a Christian are working hard, have great work ethic, are using your time the way you should, you're being a good example. You make Christianity more appealing, right? Let your, let your work be your witness. So are we stealing our employer's time and money? Okay. So... There's so many distractions anymore, and a lot of them have to do with technology, right? So maybe you're stealing by being on the internet, doing your own thing while you're supposed to be working. Uh, maybe you're off socializing. I'm bad about that one. I get really nervous in front of lots of people, but I do like to go and talk to lots of people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but maybe I've even seen this. Uh, working at a big manufacturer, I've seen people looking for another job on their phone while on the clock at their current job. Again, that's stealing, right, from our employers, their time and their money. So we're called to be Christ-like in, in Christians. So growing up, Jesus was a carpenter, and he worked for his father, his employer. So do you suppose Jesus was a good employee? Or was he an employee that was busy not swinging a hammer and uh, too busy reading the scroll of Isaiah? Or do you think he was a good worker? I think he was probably a pretty good worker. Um, so again, let your work be your witness and let Jesus be our example. Back in January, Mike presented a sermon on tithing. There I go back to that again, I guess, right? Really, It really made my wife and I think of about and evaluate ourselves, uh, we, we looked at it as giving our money 
And it's not our money, right? It's God's money. And he lets us steward it. He lets us hold on to it because everything's his, not just our money. Um, he lets us hold on to it and steward it and just ask for a small portion back. And that's all. So he asked in the Old Testament, he asked for 10% of our gross to go back to it. So speaking of gross and net income, how many of you got your first paycheck? Maybe you're 15, 16. This was me, right? So got my first paycheck. I had run the numbers. I calculated it all out. I know exactly what I'm going to be getting for my pay. And I got this check back, and it was short. Like, I, Did I do the math wrong? I didn't do the math wrong. So what happened was this FICA character came in. I don't know who he is, but he just came and stole all six dollars or whatever it was at that time it was a high paying job i had but <laughs> so the, the thing is the government doesn't steal they tax right and the difference is love so how many of you love paying taxes exactly we all do right no the difference again it's love so they don't ask us because we wouldn't give it god asks us because we love him we will give it okay so that's tithing um so what are some things we can do when we realize we've stolen? I would say that the biggest thing we can do is restitution. And we can look at that in Exodus 22, verse 1, on page 63 of your Bibles. So Exodus 22, verse 1. It says, if a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. It actually goes on a whole bunch there in if you've stolen something. But I just thought, wow, that's a pretty major deterrent, right? So if you steal a dollar from somebody, you owe them five dollars. You steal a car, you owe five cars. More than likely, you steal a trailer. You better bring it back so you don't have to come up with five trailers. I didn't even have one. I was just borrowing, <laughs> borrowing it temporarily. So, so my question here is, what, what do we do? And that's the restitution, right? Pretty major deterrent. So if you've stolen, you, we need to make every effort to pay, right? Uh, sometimes someone will forgive a debt, and, and they have that right, but it's not up to us. So we need to make every effort to pay back and not be in debt. In Luke 19, we learn about a chief tax collector named Zacchaeus who makes restitution and is forgiven. It's in Luke chapter 19, verse 8, on page 878. And it says, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So good good example, and Zacchaeus was forgiven, and so we need to follow that example. There's three ways to look at your wealth. What's mine is mine. It's my money. I earned it. I worked for it or I inherited it. Don't talk about it. Leave it alone. It's mine. <laughs> There's what's yours is mine. I like that. I want that. And one way or another, I'm going to get it. Maybe I'll get it legally. Maybe I'll figure out a way to get it illegally. And there's what's mine is his. We should all strive for that one, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> So what's mine is his, I'll share it, and I'll steward it. So again, shout out to the Backyard Bible Study. Can't get enough of that, all right? <laughs> That's right. Um, so we've been studying Titus again. So the first, the first idea is they must be a good steward. And that's referring to the elders uh, in the church, but the descriptions, again, are great for all Christians to strive for. So I think stewardship is a very out, like otherworldly, countercultural way of seeing wealth as revealed by God. I'm really struggling with this thing, guys. Uh, that everything belongs to the Lord, 
And whatever we have, he's entrusted us to steward. Mike and I joke about how I can help my clients at work with their home, their auto, their life insurance, and that stuff. Um, and then I should be giving his card and say, now go see Mike and he'll help you with your eternity insurance. I haven't tried it yet, but maybe it would work. Why can't I help him with that, right? That's what <laughs> so, um, so speaking of life insurance, um, I, I haven't yet had an opportunity to serve uh, a client's family of someone who's passed away. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, I have mixed feelings about it. On one hand, I really look forward to being able to say, look, I can't bring them back, I'm sorry, but they did leave this for you. You don't have to worry financially, okay? On the other hand, they're grieving, and that's not a fun time, okay? Um, so imagine in, someone in your family died and they left you a large estate and left you as the executor of their will. So certain portions are for you and certain portions are for your other family members, right? Um, as the executor, it's your job to distribute that estate. A steward is just like that. So everything belongs to the Lord. It comes to me. I'm the executor. I get to spend some of it on my family, on my friends, things I want. Hopefully take care of the things we need. But then the rest needs to go back to the Lord's work. In Proverbs 13.22, on page 537, it says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. So a steward realizes that this is not mine. It's been entrusted to my oversight. And I need to follow the agreement or the terms um, that were laid down for the distribution of assets. Sorry for the ums, guys. I'm really trying not to. <laughs> um, see? So do you realize that you're a thief? That you're in great debt? I'm in great debt. We're all in great debt. And it's worse than we think. Not only have we accrued a financial debt to God and to others, but we've also accrued a completely different category of debt. And that's a, a debt we've accrued through stealing. Sin is stealing. So that big long list we had up there, that's ways that we, we normally would say that's, that's stealing. But I would argue that all sin is stealing. It's all a violation of the Eighth Commandment. And here's why I say that, right? So God made us to love. When we don't love, we're stealing. Okay? He made us to serve, and when we don't serve, we're stealing. We're stealing the time that God gave us, stealing the money, relationships, words, and opportunities that God gave us. When we fail to invest our lives into God, who, by the way, is the owner of our life, we fail to give God the return on his investment. We're in sin against God and stealing from him. We're accruing debt towards God. So here, here's how Jesus says it in a prayer that you might know. It's pretty common. Most people know it. Matthew 6, it starts with, Our Father who art in heaven. And then in, he goes on into verse 12, and it says, Forgive us our debts. Sin is debt. It's stealing from God. Here's how the Bible explains it regarding our spiritual debt in Colossians 2, 13 through 14, back on page 984. says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of what? Of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So you don't pay God back, right? Jesus does. God became a man named Jesus, lived here on earth without sin and without debt. And then he was that ultimate sacrifice for us. Our debt was paid. Isn't it interesting that Jesus was crucified between two thieves on the cross, right? One that didn't turn and say, you are God, save me, right? Forgive me. And one that did turn 
to Jesus, declare him God, and ask for forgiveness. And, and Jesus said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's that easy. The offer is there. So not only does Jesus pay our debt, he also gives us our inheritance. So basically, we would steal from God our whole lives. We would, he would then pay off our debt for us, make us his children, right? And write us into his will to receive his inheritance. Isn't that awesome? That's loving. That's gracious. That's the gospel. So the question is not if you're a thief. The question is which thief are you? Are you the one that didn't ask for forgiveness or declare God and Jesus as your savior and uh, have to pay your own debt? And we don't want to pay our own debt. It doesn't sound very good. Or do you want to turn to God and have that debt paid for you? So what's your next step? Do we need to change our attitudes at work? Do we need to make have our work ethic be better? All these things at work, which we spend so much time at, um, is an opportunity to be a witness for the Lord. And I think that's really important, and I think we forget that in our daily lives while we're at work. Um, just being a good witness can create opportunities to share with others, right? Um, maybe it's what we're giving to God. Are we giving enough of our time? Are we serving the way we want to serve? Or maybe serving in a way that we're really uncomfortable with. But if you're called to do it, it gives you an opportunity to grow. And maybe you can speak to, speak through to somebody in a way they haven't heard before. Is it our talents? It creates opportunities. Whatever you're into, right? If you're into playing frisbee golf, if you're, whatever you're into, use those talents to spend time with people and create those opportunities. And then is it our treasures, our tithing? So these are all things we need to think about. Maybe we need to make restitution, right? And it might not even be financial restitution. So that's what I've got for you. I appreciate your time. Hopefully I didn't steal it. And uh, we'll carry on. Thanks, guys.